It was Sunday, mid-July, 1967. The female witness, then 19, had spent the day at Crystal Beach in Texas with 10 other people between the ages of 8 and 19 years of age. It was a cloudy day and the beach was nearly empty. They couldn't believe their luck. They had the entire place to themselves and they could be as rowdy as they wanted to be. They had arrived there in two cars and stayed throughout the whole afternoon. As it started to get dark, four of the group decided to go into Galveston to go dancing, so they left in one car. Crystal Beach is located on the Bolivar Peninsula, off of the road that connects the mainland to the Galveston Ferry, which takes cars into Galveston. Seven people, including the witness, had decided to stay behind. They hopped into the remaining vehicle, a recently purchased Chevy, and started driving on the sand, watching the waves as the sun dropped in the west. They had the music playing, tuned to a radio station they all liked. Two of the girls were sitting on top of the hood, taking in the nice breeze as they drove. While watching the sea as the sun went below the horizon, my attention was suddenly caught by what appeared to be a speedboat heading straight towards land. It moved the way a speedboat moves on water. The color at first was sort of silver, then it turned to amber. I told the others to look at it. At some point as we watched, the driver and I realized that the object was moving far too fast and appeared to be headed straight at us. At this point he had stopped the car. I told the two girls on the hood to get in the car, and we proceeded to drive out between the beach houses on one of the dirt roads that connects the main road to the beach. It is a very short distance. It was going on 9 p.m. I was sitting in the front seat, passenger side, and watching behind us from the open window. I was startled to watch the object closing in on us far too quickly, and it was changing colors. As we made the turn onto the main road, the object had by then caught up with us. I cannot describe how fast this took place. The witness claims that at that point the radio immediately went off. She peered out again and could see that the object was right on their tail. Inside the car the others, mostly kids, were attempting to understand what type of object it could be. It wasn't a helicopter or a plane. Everyone in the car could see that it was a UFO and they were quickly becoming hysterical. We were all aware that it was obviously a flying saucer which was supposed to not really exist, according to our government. The witness admits that they too were quite frightened. Since she was the oldest, everyone in the car was looking to her for answers, though she had none. Suddenly the driver pulls over to this side of the road, slowing down and coming to a stop. I was dumbfounded with that action and asked him for an explanation. He silently showed me that the key was locked into the ignition, as I watched him trying to turn the key, I noticed the car lights had also gone off. We carefully told the others that the saucer had taken the car's power and to stay calm. We rolled the windows up and locked the doors. The craft was hovering directly to the rear, very low and clearly visible. I was watching it through the rear window. The witness noted that the craft had two decks and a dome on top. All three levels had portholes. At the center between the two large decks was a wide rim which held panels of colored lights. These lights rotated around the craft constantly. The object was translucent appearing and glowed with light. The panel lights were green, bluish white and orange. The panels were rectangular in shape. The colors were pale but seemed to pulsate as they moved around, showing more vivid color and then back to the pale color. The witness looked but could not see inside the portholes because the glass appeared thick and dull looking and also seemed crusted around the edges. The craft had rivets at the deck joints. I was watching closely for activity inside it while trying to keep the kids quiet and calm. I started to realize that I was becoming hypnotized by these lights going around, so I forced myself to stop watching them and told the others not to watch the colored lights as well. Just after uttering those words, to not look at the lights, the car suddenly restarted. The driver took off immediately. The craft again tailed them as they drove down the road. 
It continued to tail them right up to the turnoff that would take them back to civilization and I-10 East. With that, the craft suddenly veered off to the right. The top of the craft tilted, and it was gone. It left a streak, something that the witness found to be odd given that it was nighttime. Here is a strange part of this encounter. The car radio came back on, and the DJ announced it's 12 midnight. The loss of three hours startled all seven of us. We just could not believe it. The whole situation I just described seemed to have lasted less than 30 minutes. We started to report it, but then decided we'd probably be branded as crazy. The witness did eventually come forward many years later to Peter Davenport's National UFO Reporting Center. Over the years I have covered cases describing incidents in which livestock have been killed or injured by UFOs. It certainly is without question that the visitors have a keen interest in our planet's animals. In many instances, animals seem to react even before humans do to the presence of these ominous crafts. Some believe this is because the objects emit a sound too high or too low for human ears. Often animals react in frenzy. Other times they cease movement, seemingly too afraid to make even a sound resulting in that deathly quiet described in so many UFO encounters, almost as if the animals know something that us humans don't. In the late 1960s, early 1970s, Bill Allen was working as a UFO investigator in Alberta, Canada. In that time, he dealt with scores of bizarre sighting reports and alien contact cases, many of which were included in the Canadian UFO Report newsletter. In the spring issue 1971, there included one of Allen's cases which was summarized from a tape-recorded interview. The case involved a Calgary chiropractor who, while out riding his horse, encountered a strange object, one that left him badly shaken and his horse seriously ill. It was late August 1970, 8 o'clock in the evening. The doctor, whose name was withheld at his request, was riding his horse along a river trail on the Scarcy Indian Reserve west of Calgary. The weather was clear and stars were just beginning to shine. As he rode along, he suddenly noticed that, for no apparent reason, his horse, a mare, became very alert and stiff. It started to pass manure, which, to the doctor, indicated that his animal was nervous about something. After a brief pause, his animal quickly became extremely violent, practically uncontrollable, turning and twisting wildly. The doctor noted that he had to be very careful because the river was on his left, and on his right there were trees and a barbed wire fence. He feared he might not only hurt himself, but his horse as well. As he attempted to figure out what was disturbing his horse, he suddenly caught sight of an odd, low-flying cloud ahead. It had a billowy contour and was about 70 feet across. He thought it strange, but decided to turn his attention back to his animal. He began climbing down off his horse when something caught his eye. He quickly looked back in the direction of the cloud and noticed a solid appearing object silently start to emerge. It came out as if to observe what was happening below, which, I guess, was me on my horse, the doctor told this to Alan. When asked to describe in detail what the craft looked like, he noted, it was made of a material that looked like a plastic or fiberglass of a bluish steel color or a silvery blue. The under part of it, which was all I could see, was slightly oval in shape and contained two circular vent-like structures, like the bottom of a mushroom, rotating in opposite directions. I could actually see them going around as they were moving quite slowly. The doctor stressed to Alan that his view of the craft was badly interrupted by the wild actions of his horse, but afterwards, when he had a chance to think about it, he was able to sort out the details in his mind. He remembered that the two sets of vents or slats, moving silently at first, were separated by a casing of some sort, about two feet wide, and the vents themselves were about four feet wide. They revolved about a slightly squared central piece protruding from the bottom of the craft. I couldn't hear anything myself, but I wondered if the object was giving off a sound that hurt my horse's ears, 
because by this time she was thrashing her head about very violently. I was having so much trouble with her that I was only able to catch glimpses of what was happening, but after a moment I saw the object start to go back into its cloud, and the whole formation began to rise, veering off toward the southwest. It moved very slowly, not seeming to be in any hurry. As it left, the cloud became more turbulent and began to disintegrate. It trailed behind as the vehicle moved off toward the horizon and disappeared. As the craft drifted off, the doctor managed to dismount from his nervous horse, and in a moment of relative calm, as he held her reins, he detected a soft vibrating noise from the craft as it left. He imitated the effect to Alan by making a swishing sound through his lips that sounded somewhat similar to the noise of a stick whip back and forth through the air. He thought the sound had about the same beat as the rotating vents. Alan and another ufologist, Dr. Max Edwards of Victoria, British Columbia, visited the chiropractor at his home in Calgary. They asked him if he could sketch the object, which he did. Artist Hal Crawford later reproduced the images for inclusion in the Canadian UFO report summary. He further emphasized that at no time did he see the top of the craft, but his impression was that the upper edges curved upward and inward. The bottom part, which he could see clearly, was generally concave in shape and consisted essentially of two concentric sets of vents already described. The vents were darker than the plastic-like body of the craft, which he estimated to be about 40 feet in diameter. A particularly noticeable feature of the craft was the appearance and operation of the bottom central section, which he figured was about 10 feet across and was connected to the outer rim of the vehicle by tapering beams. It had three or four spikes like antennas sticking out of it, and I could see by the motion of these that the whole thing was able to revolve. It would turn a bit in one direction, stop, and then go on, or turn back in the other direction. These rods or antennas vary from about four to six feet in length, and gave me the impression they were a searching device. In fact, the whole central dome seemed to be a sort of observation station. Although the object itself had a dull finish, the witness observed a brilliant electric blue light along its leading edge as it emerged from the cloud. He likened it to a welder's arc. The doctor went on to explain that two or three days after the incident, his horse was very head shy, and he suspected that somehow her ears had been affected by the experience. Unfortunately, however, the worst was yet to come suggesting that more than sound damage may have been involved. Within just a few weeks, the doctor noticed sore-looking spots, as if made by burning, breaking out on the horse's head. In a matter of days, these had spread down her neck, and a goiter-like swelling had started to show. Bill Allen had gone out to the farm to see the horse firsthand. Allen was accompanied by a TV crew from the Ontario Department of Education who had arrived in Calgary to do a documentary on the UFO phenomenon. To Alan, the horse's spots looked like a mass of tumors. A veterinarian had been unable to diagnose the spots, and samples from the affected area were still being tested at the point in which Alan made his report. Curiously, things would get even stranger. Along with his own encounter, the doctor told Alan about something else he saw that evening that greatly disturbed him. He noted that for an hour or so after their encounter with the strange vehicle, his horse remained quite nervous, and he decided it would be best that she be allowed to graze and calm down. But soon after I had mounted her and started on our way back, she began to stiffen up again, and I thought, oh no, not another one. But this time she wasn't quite as uneasy, and we continued along until something lying in the bush caught my eye. I rode closer and saw it was a horse on its side, obviously dead. The strange part was that its exposed side was badly singed, though there was no sign of a fire having been there. But whatever had happened must have occurred very recently, as I could still smell burnt hair, and when I got down and felt the horse, it was still warm. Also, there was no sign of rigor mortis. The doctor found this to be odd, but he did not initially connect it to his earlier UFO sighting. Instead, continuing on, he reported it as a matter of routine to a young man he knew whose family lived nearby. 
and they agreed to look at the horse the next day to see if it could be identified. But the next day, though they had no trouble finding the imprint where the carcass had lain, they were unable to find a trace of the horse itself. To their utter bewilderment, the heavy growth surrounding the spot was unbroken and unmarked, even though it was apparent that a vehicle of considerable weight would have been needed to travel that far through the bush in the first place to carry the carcass in the second. Had someone driven a vehicle out there to retrieve the horse, the bush would have been pressed down indicating as such, but curiously, there was nothing. The grass was only pressed down in one spot, where the horse had been laying. To the doctor and the neighbors, it was as if the horse had been lifted up and hauled away by something in the sky. Thank you.